Hi, this is Gloria, your life coach, and welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, leadership coach, motivation speaker, and health coach. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And today we have an amazing guest. She was with us in our program with IPEC. If it wasn't for IPEC, we would not melt this wonderful person, amazing go getter, and just uh, full of perseverance. Aaron, tell us about yourself. Who are you? Introduce. Mike's all yours. Well, hello. <laughs> I am Aaron Ward, and um, I, like you said, was in the coaching with you guys. Um, I, my coaching, um, kind of, and it's been it's been my life, my life work, my life uh, process. Uh, but it's also the way I'll coach, and it is like based on resilience. Um, but I am, let's see, almost, I just turned 49, just had a birthday, which I absolutely celebrate and love my day. Happy of, birthday. I know. Thanks. Well, it was a couple months ago. Happy happy birthday. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I make an obnoxious fool out of myself. I think we all should celebrate our birthdays. And I'm getting, here's one of those tangents I was talking about. Um, but because birthdays are, what do we remember as kids on our birthdays, right? They're fun. They're celebratory. There's laughter. There's games. There's play. And so I've just decided as an adult that every day on my birthday, I'm going to celebrate every aspect of my day, not because there's anything fascinating happening, but because it's happening on my day. And then I started broadening out into half birthdays, <laughs> which is the same thing. And that's just kind of my, my philosophy is that we should all play more. We should all laugh. We should all find our child in us. Um, and soften out some of the the more intense things that happen in our world. Um, I'm living right now in Grass Valley, and uh, I am a massage therapist. I am a yoga instructor, and I am mostly right now, I am a coach. And uh, there is a beautiful poem that I will probably have attached to a lot of my coaching stuff. And it, it's actually just a segment of a poem, and it's by Mary Oliver. And the one sentence is, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? And that phrase has always stuck with me so much. What will we do with it? This is our one wild and precious life. How are we going to choose to live it? I guess right then and there, most people know they have a life full of choices. And they don't know they have a choice to change or to make a change. And you know, knowing you only have one life to live, why not do as much as you can, right? Well, that's my fear. But I mean, kind of like you're saying, even if people, whether they know to change or not, um, I, I do believe that there, you know, there's so much fear out there. And we all are seeing it everywhere. But, you know, so many people, they base everything on fear. What if? Um, what if this happens? What if this happens? You read the news, you look at media, we're inundated with fear. We, the world is surrounding us because if we don't, you know, conform to this brand of toilet paper or, you know, what, whatever, this president, this, 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 then there's, there's so much information out there that we, we should be afraid of it. And I think people avoid change out of fear. And so we do have the ability. Every one of us has the ability to choose something different. And my focus mostly is in attitude. And we can change the way we think. We can change the way we can change our perspective. And that's also another sort of passion of mine is changing perspectives. Because once we've changed our perspective, change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change, right? Um, yeah, so I think we we all can change. It's it's when we recognize we're ready, when we recognize we can. And those are the things that sort of get in people's way. That's, that's that's so true. I, I never forget this. I told a story before on another podcast. Is I remember when I was watching my dad passing away. You know, he got 2007 had a stroke, and and um, you know, even though it took eight years for he actually passed away, mm-hmm. it's really ironic. You know, eight years goes by pretty fast. And you know, old, the old saying is, once you go to the hospital and start cutting you open, you're not getting out, and that's what starts happening to people that all these kind of issues. So, anyways, he went to the hospital. He had a small 
blood clot in his leg. It traveled to his heart. He went to the hospital, couldn't find it. He had an ulcer in his small intestine, and then had to remove his small intestine, also his large, remove his large intestine. So when I last saw him, he had no large intestine. A week or two later after I saw him, they removed the small. Mm-hmm. But it, he had no quality of life. You know, when they start operating on you like that, you already have high blood pressure. You're going through Alzheimer's, dementia, and all this. No quality of life. And I remember looking at him and shook his hand. And when I left the hospital, I said, Ron, if you do something different in your life, this will be you. Not saying the fact that, you know, death's not a part of life, but the fact that if you do the things you want to in your life, you always just be you. My dad would always say, son, I'm going to do X, Y, Z when I get old enough. And it's like, okay, well, what's going to happen when that time comes? You don't know. And here, what you're saying right now is if we're aware of a choice and able to change, we can change the way we look at, you know, everything else. So that makes a big, big difference in in people's out, outside of life. You know, like we learned in, in coaching, all of us have filters. And what we look at, if we only see, let's say, negative, everything, is not, everything around us be negative. If we see positive, everything around us be positive. And on top of that, if you have a great awareness and choice. And, you know, when I saw my dad, it's like, I don't want to live that life. And everything I've done now is to create the better life I want to because now I know I have a choice. Right. <clears throat> because now you see big, what's big capable. Difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, well, go ahead, Gloria. No, 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 go ahead. But you finish first and I'll ask you the question after. Okay. I was just going to, um, oh, I was just going to touch on that a, a little bit about, you know, um, so I have chronic pain. So um, I've, you know, it started out as a triple jump injury in high school, but then I also had a lot of hypermobility in my joints, so hips and all of my spine joints. So when I had pregnant, when I got back to back pregnancies, it's like the elasticity of my joints just went out and it never, never came back at all, even though it was kind of weak anyway. So my, basically my spine has been compressing since then. And so I've had, I think five back surgeries now, and I've been in chronic pain, let's see, for 17 years. And it's something that's always there. Um, I don't get to get away from it, but I have learned so many tools as far as medicating, uh, sorry, meditating. There was some medication, uh, but some meditating um, around just outside the pain. You know, the pain is there and it can take over. And, and this can be applicable to anything in life, right? We have these pains and the focus takes over as opposed to, okay, that pain is there, but I had to learn that. But if I put my focus elsewhere, then the pain is not so intense. It's still there, but I can get it to the back burner. So it's not, again, it's not my focus anymore. And it's sort of like, I have a choice in that. And I think I believe all of us do in, in you know, kind of like what you're saying, Ron, is that we all do have a choice. It's but it takes work. And sometimes it seems the idea of a positive outcomes, I think, seems overwhelming for people at times. Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, a lot of people are not ready for. I, I guess it goes back to one thing. Uh, seeing is believing. So mm-hmm. people can right. see it. like It's tangible. Like I can touch it. I can touch my keyboard. I can touch my, my monitor. I can touch my microphone. Oh, it's yeah. there. Right. But it's really hard people to transition to know you got to believe it in order to see it. That's the conundrum right there. We're stuck in, a lot of people are stuck in, they have to, it has to be tangible. They have to see the end result or control the end result. And that what lies in a lot of frustration and, and stress is that I want to control all the outcomes. Well, what if you did control that outcome? It's not really what you want. Yeah. Um, I read this. I don't know if you guys have heard of, um, it's called the desire map. I can't remember the author. I wish I could because I'm just really bad at names and stuff. But she did this. The whole work was like her and her husband, every year for New Year's Eve, they would set up a, um, like just get a big poster board. And they divide it into four sections of the different areas of their lives. And they would set goals for the year. Um, like, okay, this is what we want to do together as a couple. This is business. This is you know, financial, health, you know, whatever, whatever the categories are. And then they kept realizing that they would check this every year. And um, they're like, okay, we're meeting all of our goals. Why don't we feel better? Like, why aren't we happier? And what this kind of woman did is she ended up writing this book 
and creating a kind of a workshop around it about instead of like, we tend to chase our goals. We think that's going to bring us the emotion we want. And she shifted it down into identify what emotions you want to feel and lead with that. What's going to bring me, you know, like I I remember mine were uh, joy, inspiration, um, authenticity, courage, you know, and so you kind of do some work on narrowing it down, but then it's sort of like, then I can set my day as far as like, what's going to, what's going to bring courage? What's going to, what's going to make me feel courageous today, you know? And then you start doing it that way instead of setting goals that, you don't know what the outcome is. You don't know when it's going to happen and you want it, but then it's sort of, again, you're chasing the goal as opposed to, or you're chasing the emotion. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. Erin, mm-hmm. uh, I have a question for you. So did you, um, you know, speaking of goals, did you have or set any goals for you, for your life? And um, did you have to go through any of those fears? And I know there's always going to be obstacles in life and then the changes. So is your question, can you, can you say the question again one more time? Did you have, um, in the past before becoming a life coach and going through the training that we did, was there a, a goal that you wanted to achieve or did you set a goal for yourself um, that you wanted to achieve before you discovered becoming a life coach? Oh, okay. Um, Well, (laughs) I remember having a conversation (laughs) with a kid in college Mm -hmm. and he's like, Aaron, he's like, everybody else seems to want something, to want to do something, to have something ever. He's like, you don't seem to want anything. And I was like, huh. I said, I don't see it that way. I said, I want to be happy. <laughs> and that was my, mm-hmm. that was how I set the stage. You know, life events turned into what they did, you know, and, and I just think it's interesting that I was handed a lot of challenges um, as to, okay, where are you going to find joy in this one? You know, funny little test. Um, but, you know, because I did different things, I just, I, I did a lot of sampling of different things. You know, like I love body work. I mean, at my core, I'm a body worker. Um, I love giving massage. I mean, when I give a massage, I feel like I've just had one because it is such an enjoyable process for me. Um, and you know, I, as far as a goal, not really. You know, I didn't have any big headline thing. It was sort of like, okay, what, what, what will bring me joy? And I've been a little bit more focused on the now um, and the present. And yeah, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. It does. Just, yeah. And, and then, so- um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Nah, just... <laughs> 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 Again, Go ahead, my brain's it. just on fire right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was it. Um, I just wanted to know that if you know if how how you know how you've how about this? How and when did you realize, or at some point, you wanted to you know become a life coach? Where did that come about, mm. or how? Uh you know, a lot of it, well, I had, when I was living in North Carolina for a while, um, I had, I was going through a, a difficult time and I, I had actually joined this like women's kind of support group and it was for professional women or just, you know, um, however you des- define professional. Um, but it was just a support. It was really just a place where women would get, get together and we'd have nice topics. And it was really just a like, okay, everybody share an aha moment or everybody share a this is what's great. And it was just a room full of people supporting each other. And there was a ton of compassion and just a ton of like, Hey, I'm honoring you as a person. Right. And, and that was lovely. But in that there was an iPad coach and I actually did some work with her. So that is sort of what started it. And that was about seven years ago. 
six years ago. Uh, and then, mm-hmm. I, but I was kind of figured, I mean, I liked it. Um, at one point I was going to go back to school and get my uh, master's in social work. Um, because I know that I'm a healer, you know, I know that I am here to help in whatever capacity for others. And, you know, the gifts along the way, you know, I have two, you know, one autistic child and the other that was, you know, pretty emotionally challenging when he was younger. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I have been given the gift of patience beyond what I ever thought possible. And, and I'm an observer. You know, I like to observe people and I love to observe human behavior and how we interact and uh, how people process information. And so I just, with my own work involved and with my, you know, the the stuff that I've been doing for my own resilience and to keep myself as positive and whatever, that the coaching just seemed like a natural thing because I don't, I didn't want to do therapy, you know, and that's where it was kind of balancing between the two of I don't really want to do therapy work with people. I want to grow with people. I want to facilitate mm. somebody else's what's next. And yeah. I like that. You want to grow with people. Sounds really good. So so before coaching all this, what was your dream in life? Like like what did you fantasize about our being? Being. Hmm. It sounds kind of weird because I didn't, I don't think I have what, what typical, typical goals. I mean, honestly, my, you know, I went from, I lost myself after I had children because they had so many needs and I just put Aaron on the shelf. And so having children with special, you know, additional needs, there was a ton of therapies. There was a ton of like learning different behaviors, Um, learning how, you know, with my son who hardly speaks, it was learning to interpret the world to him and, and him to the world, uh, because there isn't that communication. And so my, my goal was about helping my children live the most fulfilling and enjoyable lives that they could in whatever capacity that was going to look like. My, my whole focus was about Again, getting them all the services that I could get them, getting them all of the early intervention I could get them and staying on it and staying on the schools and making sure they were, you know, kind of supporting my children the way they should be supporting them and all of it that I just put myself on a shelf for the longest time. And it wasn't until about 2015 where I said, oh, wait a minute, there's no Aaron anymore, (laughs) you know, and I had to Mm. do a really deep investigation to find to find out where I'd gone and to find out how it had happened and this and so honestly my my dream has always been I mean you know I'd love to have the family I would love to you know have a close relationship with my children and you know I think we all start with these ideas and dreams and then we realize along the way that like oh right. (laughs) You know, there's a little bit of a (laughs) grieving process that sort of has to happen because we obviously are not always handed what we, what we think, you know, we create a story for ourselves, Mm -hmm. we create a dream and, um, you know, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I understand that because a lot of the times when you have kids, you, Usually, well, you know, as a mother, and I can't say, you know, dad doesn't do the same thing. Uh, Any parents will do this. They'll always put their kids first. Their their kids comes first and they're always on the top of everything else. Until one day, like what you said, then you realize, wait a minute, (laughs) what about me? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's a pretty, I mean, as as far as from people I've talked to, it's a pretty common story, you know, with, uh, it is, you know, and again, I mostly raise my children by myself. Um, and yeah, you just, there's no real time. And then it's sort of now I appreciate, but I do on some level, I appreciate all of my experiences, even the yucky ones, because I see how, oh, 
well, there was another way to do that. You know, <laughs> I didn't do it. And it's not about mm. regretting because I, do, I don't regret anything. It's, you know, I did the best I could with the information I had at the time. And I think I believe that in all of us. I don't really believe that we go out intentionally trying to harm others. Um, but it happens, right. right? Just of our, all of our lack of communication abilities amongst ourselves. Um, I'm surprised any of us can actually really communicate sometimes, but, <laughs> but yeah, I just, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know go where ahead. I was. I lost myself. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you can continue. <laughs> I know, but I lost my place. So, <laughs> and you know what? It's in, and, and I also see that how, you know, that was, I can only imagine how tough that was for you raising both or two with, um, with disabilities, you know, and how old are they now? Uh, 18 and 19. Wow. Yeah. And all, all those oh, years from day men. one, see, you have, yeah. So, I, you know, and like I said, I can only imagine from day one having to take care of both. Um, or actually, you know, I can't even imagine <laughs> how tough that would be and how you can really get lost and you lose know, Aaron. And here's the thing. It was tough and gorgeous at the same time. Like I, I never mm. didn't appreciate what I was doing, if that makes sense. Like I knew how lucky I was to be a stay at home mom. I knew how lucky I was to be in a situation where I could, that I had the means and the time availability to care for my children the way that they needed to be cared for. So yes, I never slept. <laughs> and yes, it was <laughs> very stressful at times balancing <laughs> because the boys couldn't be more different and we're at each other quite a bit. Um, you know, but honestly, the gift of being able to be present with them was far outweighs the struggles. But yes, I did put my actual person on hold. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, at that time that we, when you did that, I'm sure that nothing came to mind about yourself first in the beginning until you said you recently realized, okay, we're, you know, what happened to Aaron, right? Right, right. And when you realized that, did you have to make, and I think you did say that you had to make some changes and take some actions. And what was that like? And where did you start? Well, where I started, I was in, I was actually gone to, because, you know, part of the tale here is that um, my ex-husband had tremendous amount of money and um, legally took my children from me. And that there was so much in that. I mean, the stigma, who gets their kids taken from them? And it's like, and people just don't realize kind of what, what can happen and how the courts and money can really make things head in a certain direction. (laughs) And I was at the Mm -hmm. other end of that. And unfortunately, um, I was in the darkest place. And um, for me, what I did was, I remember I had my rock bottom situation. And, but I was so happy to learn that my rock bottom was not suicide. (laughs) I mean, I was dark. I was down. I didn't, how could a mother not have her children? I mean, I just, there was nothing in my world that could make sense of that. Um, so one night I literally got, I'm like, okay, so my rock bottom, I have nothing left. I've got nothing else to offer. I learned that my rock bottom was I either call my doctor and ask to to get into the hospital or do I just take myself? That was my question. And I sat with that question. Okay. Which of the two? Cause I'm basically in my mind, I'm handing it over to somebody else. And so I was grateful to know that that was my rock bottom, that I give up, but I'm giving it to somebody else, you know? Um, and, and then I fell asleep and I woke up and I was like, all right, so now we know I don't want to end my life. So we got that cleared away. Um, so now what do we do? Okay. What do you know? How do you find joy? I started inundating myself with joy. I got on happify.com. So I'd get a positive message to me. I started a gratitude journal. Um, I started on Facebook, my hundred days of happy, where I had to take a picture and or a post every single day about something I'm happy about because it was that fake it till you make it. And I was determined to bring joy back into my world. I was determined to inundate myself with joy to counter 
the other stuff. And that I figured the more I could, you know, find this, you know, this play, this laughter, you know, all of these things that I know are my core person and who I am, um, just bringing that back up and bringing it back to the, okay, you're on the front burner now. (laughs) The rest of the stuff is just going to sit in the back. It's there. It's happening. But where do I want my focus to be? So that has been so much of my healing. And then just, I keep practicing, you know, like I took myself to Greece for a month. And I, you know, I just stayed on a little tiny island and I wrote because I really like to write and that's just how I process information. So I did that. I, um, I went on some silent retreats through, you know, meditation center that I'm affiliated with. Um, you know, I just kind of did all those things that helped me feel grounded and secure and just started a new foundation for myself. So I heard right here listening to you. So something situation happened in your life where you're almost hit, let's say, rock bottom, not to commit suicide, but you got to do something for yourself to have self care. Yes. What was that? What, what happened? I, I didn't hear much detail on that. Uh, about needing to find self care, or no? Before that, before you hit, rock, what was going through your life that you needed self care? Like what, what was happening? Oh, my, my, I was in court. I was in a child custody battle with my ex-husband and it was about a three-year process. The trial itself was 10 months. There was 18 days in court for, oh my God. and literally there's so long. uh, I know (laughs) it was over a 10 month period. And like every time we'd go in, well, she keeps doing this. So we have to come back. So it was grueling. I don't talk well in front of usually more than one person. It's not my specialty. So being up on a court and then having someone so nasty and verbally just attack you, peppering you with questions, challenging you, criticizing you. I mean, my ex-husband was doing it at the same time. I was just daily throughout the day being beaten down and, you know, shamed and insulted and you're this, this is why you're this. And I mean, it just, it was so horrible to just, and I was, I was numb. I didn't understand how any of it could happen. Um, a lot of the stuff were happening. It was like, you got to be kidding. Like that too. Like, oh my gosh. And then another day, that too. Um, there was there was just so much. And again, between my pain and my focus was my kids. And I couldn't believe this whole situation was happening. That I just, you know, it was it was challenging. Um, so that's kind of where I ended up with rock bottom is that because I'm like, you gotta be, you just took my life away from me. My whole life was focused on my children and, and, you know, I was feeling, I couldn't imagine what they were going through and that killed me to think they have no idea and no real way of understanding what's happening because there's no sense to it. There's no sense at all to it. Um, so yeah, that does that answer your question, Ron? It does, and okay. obviously you, you went through a very difficult uh, battle. I mean, eighteen days in court. I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, how do you get that much time off work? And you know, uh, exactly. I, I, I'm assuming your ex had a lawyer, and they were attacking you. You're by yourself. You had no backing to help you out. Oh, I had um, a lawyer. I mean, obviously, it just was not very effective at all. He was. Oh, it wasn't effective. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 what, he's what I call. He uh, <laughs> Is an empty suit. He just shows up in a good suit, but it's very empty. <laughs> I know, but he would also like just when I would go to the appointments with him, he would railroad me. Da, 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 da. Basically, I found myself like he also spoke to me the same way my husband spoke to me, the way his, the attorney was speaking to me. I'm like, wow, it was just so interesting to me that like I kept bringing these harsh people that were. And I'm like, I I can't win here. <laughs> Somebody be nice to me. I, like, mean, I was just like, just somebody, I, please be nice. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking about the lawyer and you're paying him to represent you. Shouldn't mm-hmm. he have your best interest? Well, that's that's sort of how it's supposed to work, Ron. <laughs> yes. That, that, I would Indeed. think so. Because I, I mean, I saw, I, I'm with the personal situation. I talked about this before my podcast is, um, uh-huh. So mine wasn't like yours. Mine was a little more difficult. So in 2007, mm-hmm. I got married. There's someone I shouldn't have gotten married to. And we were married for like 10 days. It was, it was just a, a 
disaster. Um, she oh. was an older woman. She mm-hmm. had four kids. She was going back and forth with the baby's daddy, kind of kind of drama stuff. And um, so we filed for divorce, but it stayed on the docket for 13 years, meaning that we didn't do anything. Right. That's you were it. So separated or I, just legally separated, but we didn't find okay. a process. I didn't follow up, yeah. you know, people procrastinate. Yeah. So yeah. end up what happening is one day I say, you know what? COVID hit. I'm like, okay, I, I gotta, I gotta do something. So I start calling lawyers and some lawyers call up. Oh yeah. I want to have this case. Oh, before we can talk about your case, I need a $500 retainer. Yep. I'm like, uh, no next. So I finally found a lawyer in Pasadena and I thought it'd be open and shut. We had no kids together. We have no assets together. We have nothing. We don't want anything. We just, we just want to be done. And I mean, first of all, the case is 13 years old, so they have to fire uh, the file a stipulation, which is just pay the court $435. Say, hey, look, I made a mistake. Can you give me an extension? We got the extension. Then what happened is that some pa- some paperwork was denied. Then she, my lawyer had to find some kind of legal lingo dot one zero zero FX, whatever, <laughs> and finally got passed. So finally, just two weeks ago, after 13 years, we finally submitted the, the, the judgment for dissolution of marriage and i can't wait until it's done but i can only imagine what you went through and mine was just 13 years and we just we were done we just want to get out of here and it seems to be that your your husband definitely was some kind of uh i, I correct me if i'm wrong i do apologize was some kind of narcissist or, or sociopath well those are similar terms that I've chosen to use, but honestly, on a webcat, I am I am cautious about what I say about him because when I tell you okay. everything is used against me, regardless of what I say. <laughs> so no. I know, but but yes, I would I would those are terms that have crossed my mind as well. <laughs> and it's, uh, no, what, you can't. You there's no the reality fifth. there. There's no. The realities are so drastically different that it is. It's hard to, there's no communication because it can't be. I mean, we communicate from two different planets. And so everything is, you said, no, I didn't say what. And then it's like literally nothing can be spoken, texted, emailed, anything without it being this huge thing. And so it's it's very challenging to work with, <laughs> work with an individual who, uh, favors only their way of thinking. Uh, there's a lot of rigidity in the thinking. And those are hard people for me to work with because there's an absolute and there is one way and that's it. So <laughs> okay. congratulations on yours. Thing. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Almost there. Almost with done. yours? I'm happy. Good. Yeah. So yes, you're just waiting for, for it to come through, right? I'm waiting for some judge to just stamp the final approval and be done with it. That's what I'm waiting for right now. Nice. Oh, good for you. I do. <laughs> I do. I do remember the names. Like mine didn't end with a marriage ending, but you know. Uh, but I'm. I'm. I remember that feeling, like when. Um, <laughs> it was like, just take me. I mean, I still haven't changed my name. You'd think I'd at least have done that by now, but. Oh, that's on, that's on the way. Gloria, are you, are you, are you realizing I have two different last names? <laughs> yes. I was like, oh, now you know okay. why. That makes sense, <laughs> that makes sense now. <laughs> yes. I do yeah. have a question. Did you, um, when you said that you were, um, so did you, I guess I'm assuming uh, that you felt defeated at some point in your mm-hmm. life then? Absolutely. Lower than defeated, whatever that is. I was full blown victim. <laughs> I was absolutely at again, like Ron. I mean, I was. I was rock bottom for me, like whatever that means. Um, but it was my lowest. It was my lowest experience. And I think, I you know, like I think we all tend to think of some things as like rock bottom. It's like oh, people who drink and they lose everything, or. People choose to take their own life, you know, whatever, whatever anybody's rock bottom is, but it's kind of like all of us, right? We each have our worst experience. And, you know, I've had people that have heard my story or some of my stories 
And they're like, Oh my God, I'd never be able to survive that. Like, I can't believe. And I'm like, "Mm, yeah, but when you're challenged, it's amazing what we're capable of, you know, it really. And again, that's why the, the resilience piece is so important to me is because, you know, and I've always loved that. You know what I like? Go ahead. Mm Mm-hmm. No, go, you finish. Oh, I was just going to say that quote I like is, you know, you get, I can't know again, I don't know who said it, but you get knocked down seven times, you stand up eight. <laughs> and I just, kinda I was just going to say that. that. How are you? <laughs> that's great. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I was just going to say exactly the same thing that what I like about, you know, this or any challenges in life that you go through is that exactly what the quote said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the sad part, I, I don't know if it's sad, but the only thing about it is that you don't realize that until actually after. Oh, sure. You know, yeah. Obviously when you're going through the process, it's not, it's not a great feeling mm. and it's almost like you're losing hope. You're feeling defeated. You just want to give up, but something, something there somehow keeps you going. Mm-hmm. You know, and keep, it's keeping you strong. But to me, um, you know, whatever situation we've gone through in life and any obstacles or challenges, you know, even for me, the way I look at myself now is I wouldn't have been where I am today. I wouldn't have been the strong minded person, woman that I am today had I not gone through any of those in my life. And I think, you know, though I see you and the way I know you, I think that that your experiences in life and at that time of your life, you wouldn't be here speaking this way if had you not gone through that. Absolutely. And that's that there in lies the gift of everything, right? The gift of our tragedies. It, It really is. It's like, okay, we all hit these blocks. We all stumble. We all, and again, whatever your version of the worst thing that's ever happened to you. I mean, again, that is very valid, whatever it is. And um, there's always somebody's story that ours is worse than or somebody's story that's worse than ours. You know, it's not even a comparison. It's like whatever your deal is, whatever your experience is. Um, yeah, I just, I again, we're back to that choice thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I choose again, to you, stand you back up. Choice. I've chosen to stand back up each time <laughs> because yeah. sitting down is not an option. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because, um, I, I had, um, I had a weekend with three of my other girlfriends this past weekend and one of the reasons why we did this is because one, you know, we haven't really hung out and seen each other in, you know, how many months since, since the pandemic, but because, you know, each one had been going through something in, in their lives currently, um, mostly just not being happy. But what we did, we did something a little different besides having fun was more like talking and I called it like an intervention. Right. Mm. And I heard everything from each one and some may not have sounded great and one may have gotten as far as you know where she finally had to talk and let it out and and just kind of burst into tears mm-hmm. but i think that she needed to hear a lot of things from us from her other friends our opinion and what we think and you know but at the end of all of that i think what they've learned is that, yes, I have a choice. I chose to be in this situation currently, and I've put myself in this situation, so I'm going to put up with it or sacrifice. Mm. But they recognize that there was choice for them. Right. But, you know, it's not always where, you know, if you're going through it, you're not always recognizing that until actually you either talk about it or you hear from others. Okay. Yeah. But in the meantime, if it's just you yourself, you're kind of not aware of it. Al- although it's there, you do, he- you do kind of feel that, but you're not, I mean, you may be somewhat aware of it, mm-hmm. but you're not really 
I guess, open or owning up to it, maybe some, you know, still kind of in denial about it until you finally just talk about it and then it comes out. And then hopefully that you do something about it, you know? Yeah. And that's like, you know, it's almost like bumping up against the walls of awareness. Like, oh, I'm actually not alone. Everybody is sort of suffering in their own way or has their own story or whatever. But sometimes that's what it seems like people really respond to because it's almost like, oh, we're looking in. They're they're telling a story that's going in. So now all of a sudden I'm doing it for myself. Oh yeah, I got some stuff too, don't I? You know? And you're right that mm-hmm. it, sometimes people just aren't even aware of how much or they just they shift it out of their focus and they march on to doing whatever. But that distracts them from the from things that, you know, may or may not be holding them back. Did did you feel at that time a certain point or a certain time that you felt like you will not be able to get out of that situation? Um, I didn't, for the longest time, honestly, it's hard to explain how I felt, but I felt numb. And, but then once I kind of hit that place, I didn't think I wouldn't get out of it. I actually know even like right after the trial, when everything just kind of came crashing down, um, I remember I couldn't do much, but all I did know was that someday this information is going to guide me in some other way. Like there will, I will see the benefit in this situation at some point. I have no access to it right now, but I held on to this notion that I knew I would someday because I believe that about the world. Like we get handed stuff and it's, you know, in in my belief system, I, I wouldn't have been handed something so challenging if I wasn't meant to revisit it, refocus, you know, when I was on the other side and use it to, again, kind of help others. You know, I have this experience. So I feel like I'm in a position to be really compassionate for others that have had a similar position or experience. Did you, um, so did you really feel that way that, you know, you felt like something good will come out of that? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't feel it, but I knew it intellectually. Let's put it that way. Okay, okay. It's sort of like was it some kind of intuition? Yeah, I would say that. Or just for me, it felt like a knowing. Like I, I just knew it. Like somebody cannot get handed the level of challenges that I was handled handed if if there wasn't something positive that could be done with it. And so I knew I didn't have access to what it was that I would do yet. I didn't have, you know, like at one point I thought I was going to, I'm like, you know, maybe someday I'll end up in a courtroom and fight for, because nobody in the courtroom, nobody knows anything about um, disabilities and what it means in relationship to other people and how my court situation was manipulated so much because the courts didn't know um, kind of how their decisions were affecting the children. Um, and also just the things that were said that it wasn't actually true, but there was nobody in there to fight it and say it wasn't true. And because again, the courts don't know. And so all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe I'll be an advocate for the courts and, or maybe I'll just be an advocate for parents. I mean, I was just, I knew at some point something, I was going to do something with it. That's amazing. That's how you turn a a difficult situation into a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's how you transition. It has to be. (laughs) Yeah. Or otherwise you're just stuck with a terrible situation. (laughs) It's like. I'll call you stuck in a quagmire. You're just going round and round in circles and you just can't get out of it. Like your mind, you want to get out of it. You know you Mm -hmm. can, but it's just. It's like the old saying goes, God doesn't give us what we cannot handle. So if you go into a difficult situation, it's something, the reason why you're going through it, either to teach you something or to prepare you for something in the future you just can't see. Because we can't see the the other side, right? We just know what's going on right now in front of us. Yeah. There was a, um, it's funny you say that about God, because that was one of my hardest things, because I don't come from a religious background at all. And so... I found myself very triggered by all the people that were supporting me saying that exact same thing. Like I absolutely get the comment, but it was, it was interesting how I was triggered by that so much. Cause I'm like, okay, I get it. And I, 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 I knew, I knew what the, the lovely message and the 
what was being offered me, right? I, I, I knew it, but there was something that I just, for whatever reason, I got rubbed the wrong way with kind of things that are said um, that most people would say. Um, and it was interesting because I did this, um, I went and I did a yoga teacher training. I spent a month at a, an ashram, a yoga ashram um, up here in Northern California. And there was this story that was told and it was, you know, the Swami was walking through the streets. There was big crowds around him. Everybody wants to, you know, be near the Swami. And um, somebody ca- came out of the um, somebody came out of the audience and hit him on the head with like the back of an axe, and you know it hurt him. Um, he was taken away to a jail cell. The Swami walked down, and he wanted to see this man, and he prostrated to him. He put a garland of flowers around his neck, and he prostrated to him, honoring him. And he said, God came to me in the form of my attacker. And that phrase, when I heard it for the first time, was like that little note that it was like, ah, it was that little, little piece that I needed to hear that someday I would actually hold forgiveness for my ex-husband, you know, because it was, what did he try to, what was being taught to me? What lessons was I supposed to be learning or can I learn based on my situation? Is that, is that clear how I've connected that story. I don't know if it's making sense, but it's uh-huh. like, because I no, make sense. Yeah. I just, it's like, again, what can we learn from what we've done? What can we, what, what can we do with what's happened to us? I guess. Have you forgiven him? I have. His behaviors continue to drive me nuts, but I have forgiven his shortcomings. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Because <laughs> I don't want to carry him anymore. You know, I mean, I can be mad and angry and I do get angry at his behaviors because it does continue. But as far as him as a person, I see him as this traumatized six year old child because I know what he went through. And for me, that's how I can hold him in forgiveness. He did the best he could with what he had, whether it's, you know, neurological wiring or. <laughs> Or, you know, whatever's going on in that kid's world. Um, he did the best. He, he's doing all he's capable of. So again, how can I hold him to something else? It doesn't mean I like it. It doesn't mean I want to be around it. But I'm also not going to carry his stuff anymore. That's really, really good. Awesome. You realize that carrying that weight or carrying that excess on your shoulders only prove or only proved to be more suffering for you mm-hmm. than another person. Absolutely. Like that quote, letting holding a grudge is like letting somebody live rent free in your mind. I always like right? that. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Wait a minute. I've heard that once and I'll remember it now. Yeah. Get get out of there. You're not welcome um, there. <laughs> That's so my happy place. How are things <laughs> <laughs> how are things now with you? And you know, in case of I don't know, I think it's been um a few years now since, right, with with your ex husband and, mm-hmm. and the kids. I know that y- you you have you still have this great relationship with your kids. Um and that you continue to try your best and see when you can and as much as you do. I, but because I to, they're both with him in a different state. Yeah. Well, the oldest actually moved and he's closer now. And he, he's been, you know, he's, he's, um, yeah, he's, he's moved to Las Vegas now of all places. And he's, but he's coming oh, out to spend wow. Thanksgiving with me and he's been texting me and exchanging with me. And I think, you know, I don't know if it's being away from, his other living situation, but all of a sudden he's available for me. And I just celebrate every text he sends me. I celebrate every time he gets on FaceTime with me, he'll get on with he and his girlfriend and we just chit chat and laugh and stuff. And then my younger one, you know, I'm allotted my 15 minute phone call every night. And so I will sit on the phone with Maxie and just, so he knows I love him. So he knows I'm here still. And yeah, that's kind of how I handle it. Sometimes I cry off to the side by myself because I miss them so much. But <laughs> for the most part, I'm, yeah. you know, I celebrate the moments I have with them. It's all about celebrating the little things because 
what you're going through right now with the young, youngest one, like 15 minutes a night, that's detrimental for, for someone who loves their kids that much. But eventually that will change. It's just a matter of time. Eventually that it will get better. And eventually the possibility. it's yes. better. Yeah. Because there's a possibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is a possibility. And, yeah. and you know, Aaron, the best way of putting that too is um, I like to think of it as something is better than nothing at all. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's sort of like savor what I do have. Um, yes. I kind of, I've, I've put this, I've, I'm really big into visuals. And so lately I've put up this <clears throat> kind of sign for myself and it just says, what can I do for myself? And can is capitalized and, you know, written bigger. What can I do? Um, and I just put that question out. So I'm looking at it all the time. So it's not about the things I can't get done. It's not about this. It's what can I do? Like, what can I do right now? You know, or what comes next? What can I do? And so I just really like, I've been inundating myself with that lately. So I can talk to him for 15 minutes. I can do this. Yeah. So we call it's just, it you just kind of have to speed baby. up everything. <laughs> 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 yeah, you just have to speed up everything when talking to him. Hi, how are you? How was your day? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> well, he doesn't really respond, so it's sort of like, what are you watching now? Uh-huh. And then maybe I'll get a response, but you know, and then I have to pull out my arsenal of funny voices and whatever to see if I can get him to laugh. <laughs> and stuff. So, yeah, when I'm with yeah. Max, it's definitely it's all about play. We laugh and giggle, and you know, we play. So he's, he's, a, he's an 18-year-old, but like a three-year-old. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, I'm unfamiliar with autism. Um, so your youngest son has autism, correct? Yes, he does. And it, what what type of, it, of autism is it, if you mind sharing? Well, you know, they call it a spectrum because there's so many aspects of autism, you know, that or that, yeah. you know, and again, the way people use autism it's, it's very vast, again, a spectrum. So my son is, uh, I suppose you'd call him moderately autistic if you're kind of looking for a range. But again, that only says certain things because when you say moderately autistic, every child is different. Every person with autism is different. It just depends on how it shows up for them. Like for a good example is my two sons. My, my older son had when he was younger, he had a like a lot of spectrum like qualities things, and one of one of the main things in autism, or one of the key pieces of autism, is often the sensory system is heightened or low, lessened. And so, like Max, he is hypo visual, and so he craves visual stimulation. Like he'll get right up to the TV, and like we would play Wii Sports. And he would like get, stand right in front of the big TV to watch the baseball being thrown right at him. Like he loves the action. All of his toys are moving. Um, they do some sort of movement where it's a marble run or the gears that kind of kids play with and stuff. So they're all visual stuff. Um, my other son is hyper visual. He walks into a room and everything has the same value to him or used to when he was younger. So he would walk in a room. You wouldn't even see him looking, but he would tell me if there was something shifted or changed on the wall. And I didn't even see him look over there. But again, because everything holds the same value. And as far as like they're, they had different textures and tastes in their mouth and, and what they could handle. Um, you know, one of them wanted crunchy tortillas. The other one wanted really soft tortillas. The other one wanted, you know, just, they were just, because their tech, what they eat can be different. Um, it can be, they can get really irritated and a very sensitive mouth. Um, does that, is that making any sense? So Max communicates, but he communicates in, we kind of call it echolalia. Um, the kind of the idea is that they sort of repeat what they hear. So Max will watch shows like his little cartoons, like loves Thomas the train. He loves, you know, Maya the bee. He loves, <laughs> Door the Explorer, you know, and he'll watch all these shows and he gets little phrases from them. He uses the phrases appropriately sometimes. And so it's sort of like, oh, like, I know, but I know he got it from somewhere else, but he's able to use it applicably. But he doesn't respond to questions, you know, very well. Um, And it's funny with the whole, you know, learning to ask open ended questions with my child, everything has been you can give him a choice. Do you want this or this? Or is it yes or no? And that is all the communication with him because, I mean, I say more, but when you're trying to get information from him, they have to, it has to be a choice or a yes or no. 
Mm. So you should learn how to navigate each of your children, see who learns the best or how they learn and adapt to that change. Yes. How they they learn. Two different. Yeah. Yeah. And how they receive information and how, like, and that was so much of growing up with my child. I mean, it was fascinating because it was a whole world I didn't know. Um, It was a lot of reprogramming on my own part, how to be a parent, because this was different. It's like, okay, if Max decides he wants to lay down on the ground because he wants the visual angle of the brick on that wall from this thing, then all of a sudden he's stopped and he's laying down because he's checking out the visuals of what's in his environment. And so it's having a lot of patience and just watching and going, huh, okay, we're doing that now. And, you know, and just piecing together how he would communicate and what he would do with his actions and how he would communicate, you know? Um, so it was learning a whole <laughs> different world. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The perspective. Yes. There you go. And that's another thing. It's sort of like, I feel like as far as that whole perspective thing, it's like, okay, I've been looking at perspective differences for a really long time now. Very, very different. Like, like what you said, so different, like a whole new different world, but you also had to learn two different, um, different ways. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's, were, that was a lot totally, of totally too. different yeah. children and totally different. Yeah. Wow. It was it was fascinating. <laughs> and everything and everything happens for a reason and it got you on your path you're on today. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So tr- yeah. Exactly. So you know what, as we get ready to end our podcast, Aaron, I always like our guests to kind of end with something. So what I want you to do is kind of ex- what was one kind of takeaway you would like all of our audiences or our guests to actually hear from you about life in general? I guess what comes to mind is that sort of piece about choice and And that our choice is under our control. Um, I would love the world to, or the audience here. Hello, audience. Um, (laughs) I want, I would love to see everybody finding the child in them, or at least the play in them. um, To balance, to me, it's such a gift to balance out the rest of what comes us. Um, in all the supposed tos in the world. Uh, and again, we, we are at choice. Our beliefs are at choice for us. And we can choose to think differently. And we can make different decisions. We get to do that. I love that. And... <laughs> How are you today? How am I today? today? Lovely, actually. Mm -hmm. I was excited to to do this today. Um, I've been working on some of my own stuff. I'm I'm sitting in a room and three of my walls are mirror or windows. So I'm looking out. I'm sort of it's almost like I'm in a tree fort. So I am happiest in nature. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I am just I am feeling just love and excitement and and courage and inspiration and i just you know i get into sometimes into these these places where i'm just i am on top of the world i really am and when i sit and think about it i really am on top of the world and yes you are and you know what that just thinking of that those kind of thoughts is what actually what motivates you mm-hmm. It is. It is. Absolutely. Uh, I'm happy for you. Thank Congratulations. You. Oh, thank and you. I want, <laughs> and I want to wish you a belated happy birthday. Oh gosh. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked myself up with um, my birthday yeah. plugs. That was so funny. <laughs> yes. And you know, when I can see, I can hear 
the joy in your voice, you know, the happiness where you are today and how you're feeling. Um, you, you know, you're, you're a trooper. <laughs> I'm a trooper, man. Um, <laughs> here's something else that I was just kind of thinking of that, that I had sort of written down and it's, um, we all have our individual limitations in areas of our lives, but the abilities we possess to celebrate what we do have are vast. I like that. That's amazing. The possibilities are endless. The choices are vast. Mm -hmm. Why not live a better life? Mm -hmm. mm, that sounds great. We do have the because there are vast and many possibilities. Yeah, we do every little thing. And actually, uh, Gloria and I are doing a virtual seminar on uh, in December on celebrating the small wins. Oh, nice. You know, all of us looking for that big one, that big home run, that big yeah. thing that's going to happen, that big this. But no, it's really the small things that celebrate in the process to get to whatever you desire or want or are going in your life, yeah. and and even even things that. It happened, or things didn't go the way you expect them to go, it's still time to celebrate because what if it did go that direction? Or would I be at? It went this direction because I'm supposed to be here, not there. Right. And well, that's, that's back to the win. Plant. Like, what, what can you celebrate? Because there's always something, right? Yeah. So <laughs> even if it's not sure. the end all story, but you know, um, I love that. I love that. And that's how I mean, I think that's kind of my has been my focus as well. It's like, I celebrate each day. I make it a point to celebrate each day and probably several times throughout the day. I, I automatically go to what I'm grateful for. I automatically go. It's becoming the more practice I have at it, the more often I do it, you know, and it's throughout my day. I'll just like, what, what can I celebrate right now? What can I look at? And it's literally as I'm like, oh, that tree's pretty. <laughs> I mean, it can be that simple, you know, whatever it is that brings you something to celebrate, I guess. It really is. You can celebrate warm weather, cold weather. You can celebrate yeah. being a home family. Every little bit of life is a celebration and how yeah. you do, um, it makes a big deal. So oh, that's great. Aaron, I want to say this. Thank you for stepping out of your comfort zone and joining our podcast, Life is Sh Life's a Shuffle, because I know it was kind of one of those things where I got to do it. I'm not for sure. It's the first time. I know it's going to go my internet, and, but you <laughs> did it. No internet trouble. It was amazing, Woo! and we heard another person <laughs> that has success despite adversity, mm -hmm. despite where she came from. Aaron, you are successful. You're wonderful. You're amazing. The possibilities are endless. They're vast, <laughs> and you will explode on this planet Earth very shortly. So this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, leadership coach, and motivational speaker. Thank you for listening to the episode of Life's a Shuffle. And Erin, again, thanks for joining us today. You are a wonderful, great woman. Aww, I'm so you. glad I met you and I've connected or we've connected with you. <laughs> thank you um, for joining us today. And again, this is Gloria Life Coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle.